You are an evolutionary empath. The world needs your gifts. Hello, sensitive souls, and welcome to my Evolutionary Empath podcast. I'm Stephanie Redfeather, author of The Evolutionary Empath, which hit shelves November 5th and is a number one new release on Amazon. Thank you so much for your support of my book. You can pick up a copy through your favorite bookseller in stores and online. Find out more about it on my website, bluestartemple.org, and be sure to download your free copy of my Evolutionary Empath Activation Manual. While you're there, check out my other products as well. So let's check in on last week's self-care tip. I invited you to call upon the feminine energies to create beauty, which could be creating beauty in your home or office or on your person, however you chose to interpret it. So what did you choose? Did you do something different every day, or did you do the same thing each day? How did you feel because of it? How did it enrich your life? I have always loved creating space, so creating beauty is a natural extension for me. One of the things my husband and I do frequently is have a bouquet of fresh flowers in the house. I love their aliveness, expression, color, and scent, especially in the winter when you can't just walk outside and take a stroll through your flower garden. When the flowers begin to wane, I pull out the ones that still have a few days' life left in them and create new smaller arrangements and I often take the spent flowers and give them as an offering to my outdoor altar. So this is one of the ways that I love to create beauty in my home. For today's new self-care tip of the week, be sure to tune in at the end of the podcast. Last week, I introduced you to the feminine archetype and the divine feminine energies. Then we wrapped it up by talking about the sacred marriage and how it is an expression of our masculine and feminine walking in conscious equal partnership. Well, today I have a super special treat for you. I interview one of my shamanic mentor teachers, Linda Starwolf. Without further ado, let's get going. Okay, friends, I have such a treat for you today. With me, I have one of my teachers, Linda Starwolf. And Starwolf is the founder and director of Venus Rising Association for Transformation, Venus Rising University, where I got my master's and doctorate, and she is the creator of Shamanic Breathwork. She has written or co-written over 10 books and has dedicated her life to supporting others in releasing dysfunctional patterns of all kinds. She started out in the 80s as a therapist in the mental health and addictions field. So she's a nationally certified alcohol and drug counselor, among a thousand other things. But she draws from her personal experience of recovery uh, from addiction herself. And she has been a teacher and shamanic guide to me and thousands of people over the last 35 years. Welcome, Starwell. Thank you so much for being here. Mm, Thank you, Stephanie. It's my pleasure. Mm. So I'm just going to dive right in. Clearly, you are an empath, and and you showed up when there were not many empaths still in the world. So I'm just curious, what was your journey like growing up as an empath? Mm. Well, you know, it's a tumultuous path, and it it frequently is for people who are sensitive. Uh, And at the same time, I would say that I had a a rather um, tumultuous, what I would call initiatory path, because like you, Stephanie Redfeather, I um, know on the one hand, there's definitely, you know, trauma and drama in our lives and patterns and journeys. And at the same time, simultaneously, I trust the process. And I trust that whatever journey any of us find ourselves in, as soon as we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, and we start, as I said, listening with the third ear, seeing with the third eye, we can begin to see the bigger story of our life so that we're not just victims of our emotions or of our sensitivities, but we see the reasons for them and the times that we're born into. So yes, I had uh, a difficult time, actually. I was born in uh, Western Kentucky to a um, very salt of the earth family. Uh, And my parents were 
you know, came out of the depression era and they were really trying to move forward and be middle-class people. And, you know, uh, my mother was little, she didn't even have electricity or, you know, indoor plumbing and things like that. Um, but my grandmother, who I believe, and that was my Mammy Jones, who was known as the interesting or strange person in our family, Mammy Jones, the wild uh, rebel Baptist Celtic grandmother uh, who taught me to believe and or acknowledge aliens, fairies, spirits, ghosts, um, and Jesus all at the same time. Uh, she really was my lifesaver because she took this only child from her, you know, mom and dad who were both working and young people and put me in nature. And nature nurtures us and spirits live in nature. And that's where the fairies are. And that's where all the energies of uh, um, the supernatural world frequently speak to us through nature, through owls, through, you know, eagles, through, uh, falling stars, whatever it might be, and and the plants that grow in the earth and all those kind of things. So she connected me more to those senses and normalized them for me. So while others might be saying to me, and this is what I heard, and I've heard other people say this about themselves, that what I heard so often from many of my family members or school teachers or other people, like, she's too sensitive. Mm -hmm. She's overly sensitive. And then the second favorite thing right after that is, and she has an overactive imagination. Mm -hmm. So that tells me right there, I was, must have been feeling a lot of things, been very emotional, you know, showing my emotions a lot, uh, very sensitive, picking up on things that are seen and unseen that some others around me weren't. But in addition to that, that apparently I was seeing things <laughs> and hearing things that other people were not seeing and hearing and being told that it was just in my imagination and that, oh, and it's kind of like, never mind her. her she has an overactive imagination. She's been watching too many Disney cartoons or something, you know. So for me, uh, just to kind of uh, finish answering that question, I kind of simultaneously grew up being kind of fragile with my health at some level with feeling um, perhaps um, not totally understood by the, my parents and wanting them to love me and accept me and them just wanting me to be normal. Uh, and at the same time, my grandmother actually validating and supporting and acknowledging me. So there was an inner conflict going on, but thank God for her because it, it never left me like it has some people. I was able to maintain it and keep it for the most part intact but at the same time, feeling that I was different, odd, wrong, maybe, maybe even bad, that I was bad in some way. Yeah. So those are the things that I, you know, um, entered adolescence with, right as my grandmother passed away and died unexpectedly. So without her support at that initiation, I consider these initiations at 12, in that initiatory, initiatory phase of becoming an adolescence when the hormones are running wild anyway, and even more sensitive. Um, and thank God I had the tools that she had given me, but um, still feeling very different. And you remember that this was also the era of the early 1960s. So um, you can just kind of use your imagination there <laughs> and imagine the young hippie girl from there on who then got entangled with everything that was happening, including, you know, the music, which was awesome, the concerts, the peace marches, all those kind of things. But also uh, psychedelics and um, and other substances, and actually had a major mental breakdown um, with some of those substances, which uh, ended up in an institution for a week one time with a like a almost like a psychotic break uh, brought on from my sensitive nature mm -hmm. and the psychedelics at that time. Mm -hmm. So that's um, kind of a long answer to your question, and there's a lot more, but let's just take it from there that this is that, you know, and what I've described to you so far is from birth to about 18 years old and just in a huge initiatory phase uh, and wanting to be normal and trying really hard to figure out what that was and being a sensitive, imaginative um, 
impact. Mm -hmm. So when did you recognize that you were an empath, whether you knew it by that term or not? And when did you accept yourself as an empath if those happened at different times? Mm. I'm laughing because I'm still working on accepting myself. <laughs> you know, I'm still, uh, you know, how people look at me strange sometimes and I, they'll say, I, I was thinking that in my head, but I didn't ask you what you just answered me. And I'm like, I'm sorry. And they're like, get out of my head. I'm like, I didn't mean it. You know, I'm sorry, but I know, you know, and that happens to me a lot. Um, you know, that's been troubling sometimes with spouses or <laughs> I have to, act, you know, act like they thought of it, you know, or whatever. But anyway, um, I don't really feel that I fully accepted, um, at least like more where I am now, uh, until I was in my 30s. I think that, um, you know, I went through the 60s and I shared that part, but then I, you know, tried to be normal and I got married. I was married for the time I was 20 to the time I was 40. Um, and I had a child during that time and, you know, tried to be a good mom and just be normal. You know, I, you know, cut my hair and got a permit like Barbara Streisand from the way we were movie, uh, frizzly, frizzy hair. I got, uh, put on pantyhose, you know, I got to work a job at being a social worker and a counselor, finished degrees in counseling. Um, became an addiction specialist, uh, found my own recovery from substances, uh, did a ton of therapy, you know. Um, uh, interestingly enough, I ran into a wonderful therapist uh, at that time who was probably about 20 years older than me. And when I was just describing my, the things that happened to me and how sometimes I would lay down in my body and go out of my body and have visions. And when I would come back, I would be gasping for breath like I had left my body. And she said, I believe you're doing astral projection. And she said, I get together with a group of women and we tried to do this and none of us have ever had any success. So I'm here trying to stop it because it causes me anxiety. And she confides this in me. Wow. <laughs> so I started figuring out that maybe the, one of the reasons I was a good therapist is because even before people shared with me, I was feeling what they were feeling. I was sensing it. So that when I reflected back to them, what they were feeling, I wasn't just using the words, like how we've been taught to use words, like if they go, you know, it's been a rotten day to say, oh, so today's not been a good day. Just reflecting back what they were saying, but then just to say, I can sense you're really having a hard time, you know? And they go, yes, thank you for getting that, you know? Like, mm -hmm. you know, or to have a tear run down my own cheek, you know, um, or those kinds of things. and it caused me to have a really good track record with the people I worked with, meaning that they were able to make changes. That's what I think a track record is, is that people who would struggle to make changes, who worked with me were able to make changes. And it wasn't because I was quote, some sort of amazing healer, uh, you know, in the world of uh, laying on them hands or something. Although sometimes I would touch people, even though I wasn't supposed to, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like that. But I think it was because people felt understood. Mm -hmm. They felt gotten, they felt compassion and, you know, to be with another and empaths are certainly with others, sometimes too much for our own good. Mm -hmm. That's where the codependency recovery comes in. Right. So the thirties, I believe is when I finally begin to think maybe I'm not defective. Maybe what I have is a talent and a gift. Um, and one of my teachers said to me, you have advanced, accurate empathy. <laughs> <laughs> advanced, accurate empathy. I'm like, okay, is that a good thing? <laughs> I hope that's good. <laughs> that's great. Well, I'm really curious about your perspective on my next question, because one of the things that I assert in my book is that Western medicine and Western psychology don't know what to do with empaths. They don't have a framework. Their box is very limited. So especially with all of your decades in the field of psychology, I'm just curious your perspective on that. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> just remember you asked for it. I did. 
Well, first of all, let me say that the, the study of the soul or the psyche is what psychology was originally created for. It was to study the soul. And if you, um, I think in order to really be a good psychologist, um, you have to believe in the soul. I'm not saying you have to believe in God or anything else, but the soul, believe in something that survives this body, something that was here before the body, something that took on this body. And the study of psychology is to understand the soul's journey in a human body. And human bodies have lots and lots of sensations. That's why we have all those nerve endings. That's why we have all the senses that we have. And that's why we also have extra sensory perception. It's the animal part of us, really. We all have it. But some of us have tamped it down. We've, we've used alcohol or drugs or psychotropic medications because we feel too much. And um, for me, I feel that psychology, I came to believe that psychology was doing a disservice uh, to people by medicating people to not feel their feelings. I understand if somebody's clinically uh, depressed to the place of suicide or such hyper anxiety, they can't function. So I'm not saying that I would never take a medication if I was feeling like that to that extreme, just like I'm really like mainly stay away from antibiotics. But if I have a serious, serious infection and that's what I've got to do, I'll take them and then quickly get off as soon as possible and then load myself with good food and uh, probiotics and prebiotics and everything else. So there's a place for it, but it's a minimal place. It's, it's um, those kinds of things. Psychology, I think was more about uh, people coming together and listening and having that advanced accurate empathy and that psychologists or therapists or counselors or addictions therapists are people uh, hopefully that understand what someone is going through and not just from a book, that they themselves have walked that path. You know, I always say, if I want someone to paint my house, I don't want this to be the first time they've ever painted a house. I don't want this to be something, you know, that they're not used to doing. I want them to know how to paint, that they figured it out. You know, they, maybe there's always a first time, but they figured it out. They, they practiced painting before they came to paint my house. And it's the same thing with psychology or addictions. I want people to have a feeling of what it feels like to be me. Okay. And it's interesting that people who are very sensitive, people say, calm down, don't be hysterical. And what I would say is, if you would really listen to me, really hear me, and understand where I'm coming from, I automatically, my autonomic nervous system begins to calm me down. Mm -hmm. But when the world is on fire, <laughs> or when I'm on fire, or when there's a situation that's on fire, that's don't talk to me about calming down. Mm -hmm or just diagnose me with anxiety right. or with hysteria. And empaths tend to get more hysterical and more dramatic the more they're not listened to and understood. So I feel like that modern, the world of modern psychology, if you will, or they call it postmodern psychology, a lot of it uh, does a huge disservice to tender souls. Uh, I'm not going to say fragile beings uh, because empaths are far from being fragile. Their health can be fragile sometimes, but it's more about that they're carrying so much of the unfelt emotions and feelings of the animals, the trees, the people around them, uh, the wars, the refugees, the immigrants, all those kinds of things. They're feeling what other people have blocked out. Mm -hmm. And that happens in families that you'll you know, see families where, you know, there's one person in the family who's feeling everything for everyone else. Yep. And then that person becomes the IP, the identified patient. Mm. And when I used to work uh, in the mental health center, uh, as there was a two year period. I specifically worked with adolescents. Then they were they were the identified patients. I would always ask the families to come in and start family therapy with me. And they go, but, but it's not, we're not the ones with the problem. <laughs> and I would say, you know, I would, and I couldn't say to them, you're wrong or you just don't understand. I just said, well, come in, this will help your 
identified patient, you know. And if they stayed long enough, they would then begin to see that their um, unresolved psychic um, energy of what was going on either individually or as a family or between the partners, that that per younger person in their, that in the family was feeling it. They were feeling all of it and processing it for them because they weren't. So there's, you know, hundreds of and thousands of, uh, of things like that, you know, that I could, I'm not going to right now, I don't have time, but examples of, of that kind of thing. Uh, and that, you know, we see people ending up either in prison, institutions, you know, uh, psych wards, hospitals, mysterious illnesses, and then, you know, sometimes to the, to the uh, extent of death and addiction mm -hmm. um, because there hasn't been a place for psychics, mystics, and empaths, and shamans yeah. on this planet. Yeah. Yeah, I have had multiple clients that were actually diagnosed with something, depression, multiple personalities, agoraphobia, who through learning that they were an empath and talking about what that meant and, and then practicing, giving them life skills and having them practice, it, it completely, freed them from the diagnosis you know so i'm not a doctor i can't say that the psychologist or whatever was wrong but when they have no understanding of these sensitivities i, I see so many sensitive souls just getting pigeonholed and then wearing this giant sort of chain around their neck like oh i'm this diagnosis mm. absolutely and I, it's just such a disservice um, you know, it's important for people to remember that diagnosis didn't even exist a few hundred years ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, you might, I might say, well, you know, Mary Lou's a little, uh, strange, you know, or, uh, uh, uh in Kentucky where I came from, let's say, you know, she ain't right. <laughs> 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 but usually cause she was usually perfectly right, but it's like, she ain't right. You know, that sort of thing. But there wasn't any, you know, diagnoses are made up. And the main reason, you know what they're made up? They're made up mainly so that you can file insurance to get insurance to pay for your diagnoses. Hmm. And um, there was a time when I was working at the mental health center that a client would come in and then, you know, I'm supposed to give them a diagnosis and say what their diagnosis is, and put that in their chart. And then they have, they carry that for the rest of their lives. There'll, it'll always be in that chart somewhere. There'll be, that information is there. And the main reason for that diagnosis was to uh, have insurance pay for their treatment, you know, to pay for their medication, to pay for them to see me, to see the psychiatrist, whatever. And after a few years, when I finally realized that, um, I mean, I remember being in staff meeting and somebody saying, well, what do you think? And I'm like, well, I think this is really just what's going on. And then the psychiatrist saying, well, you know, insurance is never going to pay for that. They're saying that that person's just having a bad day or that they're having family issues. And, you know, we're going to, you know, I, I see them as clinically depressed. And I'm like, mm. okay then, but they're going to carry that forever, you know? And I'm like, but you know, I would be depressed if I lived with that family because I still, <laughs> it, 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 they come, the whole family comes in and I start feeling depressed after they leave, you know, like, uh, and so, I thought, oh my God, this is how this real system really works. You know, not that, in fact, the, psych the psychiatrist was trying to be helpful. Mm -hmm. This person get their, you know, get things paid for and this and that. Um, so I started telling people and they would come in, I would say, so if, after I see you today, once I'd established a relationship with them, I'd say, you know, what I'm sensing is this is what's going on with you. And they go, oh my God, thank you. You get it. I feel so much better already. I'd say, now, if you want to come back and see me or if you want to do this or that or whatever, and you want insurance to pay for this, I'm required to give you a diagnosis. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. And they're like, so what would that look like? And I pull out the DSM and I go, well, we have <laughs> depression. We have, you know, schizophrenia, manic depressive illness, you know, oppositional disorder. And, you know, I just got schizoid. What? And they go, wow, you know, borderline personality disorder. I'm like, do any of these appeal to you? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, well, which ones would the insurance pay for? And I'm like, we could do minor depression. And I go, let's go for that one. I'm like, good. 
That's amazing. You know, and, and I said, but here's one of the things I want you to know. You may have some sadness that's causing you to feel very lethargic right now and overwhelmed and waterlogged, but you yourself are not a depression. Mm. Okay. So be careful. Mm -hmm. Say, I have, you know, I am depressed. It's okay to say I'm depressed today, but I am not a depressive. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you take that on, that is, our minds believe what we tell them. Our bodies believe that. So it's interesting, I, you know, I was in the field quite a long time because I started when I was 19 years old working in the field. And by the time I was about 38, I was beginning to leave the field. But that was a long time. That was like 18 years of really being there. And, um, and I still went back and forth. But I knew that I needed to, to expand and beyond where I was working because it was depressing. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, uh, and you see it with doctors, you see it with nurses, you see it with healthcare professionals, you see it with, um, you know, emergency room people, you see it um, with, you know, psychologists and therapists. Um, psychologists and therapists have a very high, high rate of suicide themselves. And there's a very high rate of depression and anxiety uh, in those professions. And I do believe that it's not because they're working with the people. It's because they're accepting some of these diagnoses for themselves and try and don't, they don't know themselves how to work through this energy and not take on other people's energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for that perspective. And thank you for all the souls that touched your life that you were able to give some semblance of honesty and authenticity to, because just hearing you say that makes me go, Oh, I, I wish I had you decades ago. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one last question, um, you know, a big part of my book talks about rubber meets the road, practical skills, boundaries, and all that kind of stuff. But one of the gifts I feel like I bring to the world is context and bigger picture perspective. Yes. So I just put it all out there that I believe that as empaths, we are here on purpose. We are not a random occurrence and that we actually have a cosmic mission to help humanity ascend to the next level of consciousness, that we come with a, a refined energetic physiology, that, that we are where humanity is headed. And I know that you are so tuned in with our cosmic origins, and I just love that about you. And so I would love to hear your perspective on um, what empaths serve, what purpose empaths serve on the planet. Well, I really believe with my whole heart that no one is ever born by accident, regardless of how they got here. Uh, I know some people think, well, I was an accident, you know, at birth, my mother said I wasn't supposed to be born or whatever. <clears throat> but I don't believe that anything um, comes from the other world <laughs> into this world, whether it's a tree, an animal, a person, anything by accident. And so it's pretty simple. If we're not here by accident, then we're here on purpose. And then we look at the time that's the times that we're born in. And we really are those of us who have that, who have still have that switch turned on, if you will, of being able to uh, smell and see and hear and sense in an extrasensory sort of way and who've taken it on maybe and didn't even know how to deal with it and who have, had to learn because there was hardly anyone around to show us, you know, and maybe occasionally we found someone, we went, thank God, I found someone to, who gets me and gets what I am and doesn't think that there's something wrong with me, like my grandmother, you know, that if we're fortunate enough to have that happen to someone to find you, someone to find like somebody like my grandmother or to find me, you know, if we're fortunate enough to have that happen, and we begin to strengthen, if you will, into who it is that we're here to be. And we're able to um, take the necessary steps that we need to take around what we eat, how, how we rest, um, what fabrics we can wear. I mean, seriously, uh, what kind of environment we can be in. That we begin to strengthen ourselves in ways where we can then go on beyond, uh, if you will, survival to our dharma, to our purpose. 
And that is to, for me at this time, is that I feel that we are truly, those of us who are empaths, those of us who are, to me, empath and shaman, is, it goes hand in hand. Um, the psychics, the mystics, the empaths, um, the witches, whatever, um, that we are here at this time to be a tuning fork for humanity. That the animals remember who they are. They don't have any, pro my dogs have no problem remembering who they were. I was out walking with them today, Mystic ran right out and rolled in something dead and I wanted to kill him. But he had no problem, no matter how much I told him not to do it, to do what he knew he was supposed to do it. And he looked at me like, sorry, mom, I know what I gotta do. <laughs> and when I brought him home and put him in the tub, I said, sorry, Mystic, I know what I gotta do. But we too have this instinct and this intuitive energy if we listen to it and we learn not to be ashamed of ourselves for being somewhat different <clears throat> to acknowledge our place in in this world at this time that we are like the canary in the minefield that we can sense that what's wrong you know we can also sense with what's right not just what's wrong but we can sense that mm, this feels right this is good. Mm, this isn't, this is not true. They're saying this, but this is not true. I can feel it in my skin. My, I know. Mm -hmm. I can hear what they're really thinking and feeling, those kinds of things. As we do more of that, I believe, you know, people get diagnoses like, even like Asperger, autism. And we see like Greta Thunberg with Asperger who's the environmentalist young woman that's 15, 16 years old. And she says, and I love it that she gets right up on the stage and says, I have Asperger's. And she's accepting the diagnosis, but she's not letting it limit her. She's using it to her benefit. And she said, because Asperger's don't really need to smile for everybody. They don't really care <laughs> what people think. And also Asperger's, they think differently than other people. And perhaps at this time, we need someone to think out of the box. Hmm. So she's claiming her difference as something that's needed for this time. So I would say to her, darling, you're an empath. Hmm. You know? But if she wants to use the Asperger, that's great. There's a lot of kids that have been diagnosed with Asperger. You know? So to me, I believe that and can feel that as we begin to, when I say heal, I'm going to say transform ourselves into our sacred purposes as empaths, as sensitive people, we're going to find our dharma. We're going to find that this is the time we were born for and that people are going to show up on our doorsteps. Uh, they're going to show up in our workshops. They're going to show up reading your book, Stephanie. Um, they're going to use those tools that you've written about and there and that you've lived for yourself that you've taught others so that they too can begin to accept and stand proudly and say, I'm an empath or I'm whatever it is that I am, mm -hmm. or I'm not even going to accept any labels. I'm just going to say, this is me. I'm sensitive mm -hmm. and thank God for it because we have too many desensitized, insensitive people who are not in tune right now with everything that's happening around our world. So I couldn't agree more that our bigger purpose, our sacred purpose right now is to full acknowledge this, not only for our own um, longevity and health and happiness, but to be fully on purpose and to make our contribution for why we're here. Star, well, thank you so much for your time today. It was lovely to see you and connect with you. And I know that people listening to this are going to get so much out of what you shared. Well, thank you, Stephanie Redfeather. And again, congratulations on the birth of your new baby. And may she fly on the wings of the owl or whatever bird you wanted to fly on out into the world. And um, thank you for having me on. And uh, bravo. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, friends, it's time for this week's self-care tip. In the United States, we're getting into the holiday season, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Do you have plans for making gifts? Maybe cooking big meals, decorating every room, 
hosting the relatives. Whether you get into the holiday festivities or not, what does your regular to-do list look like? Your honeydews, your long overdues. Well, your self-care tip for this week is give yourself a break. Take the pressure off of yourself. Take something off your plate. Ask someone to help you or just let something go. I don't have to know you personally to know our world is chronically overcommitted. We are too busy. Our lives are chaotic. There is always too much to do and not enough time to do it. And over time, this contributes to a persistently high stress level, which affects our mental, physical, and emotional health. And I know you know what I'm talking about. So especially at this time of the holidays and all of the pressure to perform or just the pressure of so much to do, give yourself a break. Here's a little visual to help you. Imagine a plate with some acorns on it. Every acorn is something you have to do. Now, take your finger and thumb and flick one of those acorns off the plate. (laughs) So how do you intend to give yourself a break this week? Let me know how it goes on my Facebook page and feel free to message me. Okay, my fellow sensitives, thanks so much for listening today. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Star Wolf. She is such a fabulous storyteller and such a bright, shining energy. Next time, we're going to talk about embodiment. What is it? Why is it necessary? What is spiritual bypass? What are the dangers of being half embodied? And why is it important to pay attention to our level of embodiment in the first place? I've got the answers for you. I'm Stephanie Redfeather, and if you want to find out more about me, my book, The Evolutionary Empath, or my other products and services, please go to my website at bluestartemple.org. You can also find me on LinkedIn and Facebook. If you like this podcast, don't forget to like and subscribe to the Sacred Stories podcast. Remember, my fellow sensitive souls, you are an evolutionary empath. The world needs your gifts.